Rail runs on time will be the day that we have green government. <laughs> because we have to put down more tracks, we have to modernize the whole system, and we have to make sure that Via Rail doesn't have to take to the sidings so freight can go by. Yes. I've been a rider of Via Rail since I was probably two years old, so um, I've had quite a bit of experience, and I'm, I'm certainly glad you're just as traveled as I am. And I also work in the railway industry, and I have done for the past eight years. And my last bit of work was with Canadian Pacific Railway. And frankly, what I saw there and what I've seen from their reaction to the accident that happened in January in the mountains of the field where three employees lost their lives, I can see where that came from, the corporate attitude. And it's alarming because Rachel Notley wants to run more oil trains. Well, we have a few more oil trains that run on CP, and we're going to have a lack of mechanic all over again. And the thing that sickens me is how the party that used to bring these things up, the NDP, are nowhere to be seen. They don't even ask these questions. In fact, I think the last question I remember about passenger trains or railways altogether was actually from Aaron Weir, the independent member of YCCCF, uh, member of parliament from Regina Luban. And, uh, he was given a very trite answer by Mark Garneau, the Minister of Transport. And again, our railways are in a major, major crisis. Uh, whether it's via rail, not being able to access the track, whether it's CN with being choked up by bottlenecks, or whether it's CP who has a CEO who is tutored under Hunter Harrison. For those of you who don't know who Andrew Harrison is, he was basically Donald Trump on steroids of the railway industry. And yes, he, he was a misogynist and, and a disgusting human being. And I will say that here. But again... No one will contradict you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, if someone did, I, I'd have very, very strong words. But I, I think we are heading towards another lack of gigantic unless there is immediate action taken. And that CP is, is taken to task for the, the disgusting display of, of disrespect for those three employees that were killed in the mountains. Uh, they have pushed back. In fact, the CEO himself, Keith Creel, has made it his personal mission to push back against new regulations on handbrakes for trains in the mountains. This is absolutely unacceptable. In other countries like Spain, France, uh, Germany, ministers resign over those things. Yeah. Governments fall over those things. But in this country, it's like we have this colonial attitude of, oh, well, they were just a few railway workers. Is that really our attitude? And, and I hope it is. Well, George, thank you very much. There's a couple of points here, and I want to talk about train policy and transport policy. But first, let me just, and this may be reassuring, maybe not. And number one, I don't think there's any point whatsoever in fighting hard to export bitumen unprocessed uh, because there's no value added for Canadians to other countries. So it makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. But the reality of it is, if they put bitumen on trains, it's in a solid form, and it can't blow up, and it can't spill. But I don't want bitumen on trains, because we have too much congestion on trains as it is, and with the loss of the wheat board, and the lack of coordination over shipping grain, and the, the irresponsible attitude of CP. We don't have enough rail cars where we need them to get grain to where it needs to go for export. Uh, Vancouver Island farmers told me, what was it, Christmas two or three years ago, we were two days away from having absolutely no grain for livestock on Vancouver Island because the trains weren't working to deliver the grain. They were shipping Benjamin, and as well, uh, the CP management and ownership cut back workers and cut back rail cars and we're, I mean, how are you unprepared for harvest? The wheat board used to know that this was a seasonal activity. And these guys <laughs> don't seem to get it. So, um, black mango teak was because they were shipping back in shale, which is highly, highly dangerous and should never be shipped at all. It shouldn't be produced yeah, at all. They were also mixing uh, good, flammable goods. Exactly. The in the case of, of the bitumen, the only thing that makes bitumen really dangerous for transport is to put it in a pipeline. Since it's solid, you have to mix it with diluent, and the diluent is highly toxic and volatile, and it makes it dangerous. But they wouldn't bother mixing it with diluent to put it on a train, because then they're just paying the extra money 
to ship Dillowood, and the only purpose of the Dillowood is to get the bitumen to flow through a pipeline. So they wouldn't waste money shipping dill, but they ship solid bitumen. But back to your main point. Uh -huh. But in terms of the freight movement, this is going to be a big part of the Green Party platform, is modernizing our transportation system. In the case of freight, it couldn't be more antiquated, and we're letting a for-profit company taking the investment of generations of Canadian in the rail lines and the, the industry that was CNCP, and making it uh, a for-profit operation. They've cut back so much on safety. So I felt exactly the same way when the accident happened in field. Three men were killed because that, that company has been cutting back so much on safety, not having personnel. There used to be a caboose with personnel in the caboose. There isn't any personnel, there isn't a caboose. They're prepared to leave air brakes instead of hand brakes. And when Mark Morneau, Minister of Transportation, said, okay, now that three men have died, we are going, you think they would have tightened up the rules after the air brakes didn't hold the train above Mark Morneau to can kill him and, and wiping out that community. So, now they say, okay, you're going to have to apply hand brakes as well as air brakes, and the response, just as you say from the company, is that's too much, we won't do it, we're pushing back. Meanwhile, Vita Rail has a, an antiquated set of equipment on antiquated tracks and runs uh, every three days, and not on all the routes it used to run. What we need to do is modernize Vita Rail. And by the way, another big thing I hear across the country, and this is one of the things I'll be eternally grateful about doing this community managed tour, is that every part of Canada has lost bus service, and every part of Canada thinks it's a local issue for their province only. It's everywhere. The Maritimes have lost bus service. BC has lost bus service. Saskatchewan has lost bus service. So it's a national emergency when you can no longer say, we have efficient passenger rail that moves people around. Then we don't have buses either. So we need to have a modernized transport system where there are buses where we can't get trains, and we need light rail to be as spokes off of, so for instance, the train that lands in Moncton, we took, should have had light rail that took people to Fredericton and St. John, and then across the bridge into Charlottetown, so that every part of Canada that has population centers is adequately, properly serviced by public transportation. I mentioned earlier we're an aging population. A lot of people need to get to doctor's appointments. There are so many places in Canada where you have to get in your car and drive in winter weather to get to a doctor's appointment because there's no public transit available as an alternative. And it's not safe and we can afford better. So we're going to say a lot about transportation, both freight and people in our platform. But it's been not astonishing to discover how what I see is clearly a national crisis of loss of bus service is not treated as if it's a national problem, but it's everywhere. So thank you, George. Yes, and just the last part, CP has gone after me to prevent me from getting EI. That's when I stopped that. Forgetting EI. EI, oh, they're, they're, they're definitely paying attention to work, you should be quietly proud. <laughs> <laughs> Although you should be angry, yes, thank you. Hello. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you for coming to Regina. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to, uh, to talk to you. Um, oh, my name is Devin, by the way. Hi, Devin, thank um, you. I'll try not to stumble over my words too much. Um, so, uh, talk about community building, civic engagement, and uh, creating a sustainable future um, in the media and even in everyday life. Um, it seems to often devolve into a sort of business as usual debate about politics and drawing of partisan boundaries. Um, in contemporary governance, the basic needs of people are often forgotten when it's, uh, you know, all that seems to matter um, is winning votes and demonizing opposition. And I sort of believe that to be um, analogous to uh, a community that's, that's trying to push forward and make progress. So um, I feel like these partisan lines uh, can be huge barriers in the pursuit of sustaining a meaningful and a dynamic community. Um, especially in Saskatchewan when we're, um, we're, uh, the, the, there's big and uh, at times deeply personal divides along social and economic uh, issues. 
Um, so my question is, in your, in your experience in Parliament and um, in your other work, what are the best ways to work productively with those with whom you strongly disagree with? That's a great question, Devin. And what, and forgive me for doing this, but I forgot to mention Sandy George. I have a private member's bill for a, as, uh, because VOD currently operates without statute. Amtrak operates under a law that gives it a mandate for a legislative, legislative mandate to deliver effective, efficient passenger service to the U.S. So I've got a bill before Parliament to make sure that Via Rail operates with a legislative mandate that would involve more funding, et cetera. But I, just, I forgot to mention that, so now I'll go to Devin. How do I work with people with whom I, won't, that I don't agree very much? Productive. Productive, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> The first step, and this is, uh, well, the, at the higher level of abstraction, before I get down to personal, is if you, if you start out sure that, it, that you can find something in common. So, and that is often what's called interest-based negotiation. What do we have in common? Where can we start what we agree? And then work outwards where we're not going to. So that's absent the characteristics of the personality of people you're working with. Just, can we figure this out together? And I bet we can if we start with those things that are so fundamental that they're not controversial and we can agree to those. Can we agree to that? Okay, can we agree to this other aspect? And if we don't agree to the next aspect, is there a compromise in there? So that's kind of an interest-based negotiation for trying to find common ground. And the reason that that's so hard is that in politics, is that I'm going to first pass the post voting system Every party, except us, is looking for the famous wedge issue. Something that they can hold on to and not fix it, so that it remains an irritant that their supporters will be thinking of when they go to vote. So in the 2011 election, the reason Stephen Harper managed to get a majority of the seats with a minority of public support was a well-planned effort because Jack Layton offered the idea of a compromise on the issue, but I'm speaking of the long gun registry. It wasn't in the conservatives' interest to sit down and say, what do we agree about here? Where is there a difference? How can we protect the interests of law-abiding hunters and gun owners and also respect the rights of First Nations for hunting in territory? How do we develop legislation that meets those needs? Harper didn't want to compromise because the wedge issue, long gun registry, was how he was going to defeat liberals in writings like Larry Bagnell in the Yukon, or Derek Wells on South Shore St. Margaret's. Conservatives were elected in writings where the issue that divided people was the law gun registry. In this election, the liberals have decided the carbon tax is their wedge issue, and the conservatives have decided the carbon tax is their wedge issue, and neither of them are talking about climate change really. Now the other part of your question is how do I work productively with people when I, a lot of times because of the hyper-partisanship of the way first past the post organizes our culture as politicians, I just work on what can I really like about this person? Where do I find we have something in common? What, where, where can I look really, really hard even though they don't seem to be very nice? Maybe there was a small child within who's wounded. Uh, <laughs> mentioned who it would have been, and I had to adopt that approach. My, my, um, my, my brother in Cape Breton, who's very funny, and I don't know if this is appropriate in a community manager tour, I never thought of it before in a community manager tour, and I haven't said it out loud before, but my brother likes to say, you know, we are all blessed children of God. Just some of us are really cleverly disguised as complete sons of bitches. So, <laughs> sometimes you have to look really hard. But I find, since I'm by myself in Parliament, I don't want to be alone. I want to have lots of friends. And I do. And eventually, I hope, that the underpinning of genuine affection can affect something where intellectually or in political terms, we are polar opposites, or at least don't have much room for agreement. And, and I will say, by the way, that one of the politicians in Parliament that I really love is Ralph Goodell. We've always gotten along, and I like him a lot. Now, I know I'm a Green Party leader, so I should be saying, mm, but I just thought I'd share that because I'm in, I'm in you know, his riding here, and, and I also get along really well with Aaron Weir, um, whom I think is a very lovely guy, and I don't know what happened to him. It doesn't make sense that he's not sitting with the party that elected him. But never you mind. I get along well with people, 
but I want Queen and he's elected, so there you go. Oh, Andrew Shear. Andrew is a, uh, well, I speak candidly. When Andrew was Speaker of the House, I worked very, very hard to, to work along with him to help him achieve more decorum in Parliament. Um, he was the youngest Speaker of the House, but he did permanent damage to the job of Speaker because a Speaker of the House, for Parliament to function, we all have to suspend disbelief and believe that the Speaker of the House, no matter how they were elected or what their political history is, we have to believe that they are totally nonpartisan and are there to defend the rights of every single member of Parliament. So he did permanent damage to the, to the, to the institution of Speaker by leaving being Speaker of the House to run for leader of the Conservative Party. Because he's the first Speaker of the House in the history of Canada to do that. And it, it does damage, because it, now when everybody looks at the Speaker, they're thinking, is he young enough that he might want to run for leadership of another party? Is he really giving us a fair decision? I mean, we always have that suspicion. But you, I mean, you want to believe that the Speaker of the House is representing the institution of Parliament appropriately. And that's, that's more than a small bit of damage. mom and dad over the years, uh, so I, I try to get a full picture of a person, and um, I wouldn't mind having um, a backyard barbecue with him sometime, but I don't want him to ever be Prime Minister. So that's my personal take, and I try to be as fair as I can be. there, and, and then we could go into the spirituality issue, but never mind. Yes, oh, wait, wait, who's got the microphone? I forgot. Leah's got the microphone. Uh, Elizabeth, thanks for, for coming to Regina and thanks for all your hard work. Great question from, from Deb in there. I was just wondering, um, with the SNC uh, scandal, uh, have you spoken to uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould and how is she doing and how has this, um, this incident affected your view of the Prime Minister? Sean, introduce yourself. Well, it's more than an incident, but thanks for the question. It's, it's an ongoing question. The ongoing question for me is are, they, is, are there still forces at work to try to get snc Lavalin a, a, a different prosecution agreement? To the direct question, have I spoken with Jody Wilson-Ringgold, other than face-to-face -face when I questioned her in the Justice Committee, only exchanged a couple of texts just to say, thinking of you, this must be tough, the same kind of text messages to Jane, to Jane Philpott. I worked with both of them when they were in Cabinet and I become friends with both of them before they left cabinet. And I will also say that I'm still, you know, again, this is gonna, I'm gonna sound like such a um, goody two-shoes, goody goody two-shoes, but I'm still friends with Justin Trudeau, and I'm still trying to figure out what on earth happened there. Who, someone gave him lousy legal advice. For one thing, he doesn't understand the constitutional principle of prosecutorial independence. Doesn't understand it. Clearly doesn't understand it in his press conference this week shows he did not understand, and does not to this day understand, that pressuring the Attorney General is, is itself offensive to our constitutional principle of prosecutorial independence. He keeps thinking, well, and this is the other thing, is who is advising him? He didn't go to law school, neither did Jerry Butts. Not that people can't get into positions of power and democracy without being in law school, but if you haven't got a legal background, you're very vulnerable to bad advice, so I will say that. I'm still trying to figure out how it was that Jody Wilson-Raybould left the position of Minister of Justice, how it was that the Clerk of Privy Council felt empowered to, 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 to really harass her. He, his, the history of her evidence on this, of various continued sustained efforts to get her to change her mind, the worst actor in that narrative is the Clerk of Privy Council, who is not uh, someone who was elected, who is the person who is the senior civil servant for the Governor of Canada. And I think Michael Warnick's role is really clearly off base and he should be removed. And we need a full investigation. But has it affected my, my view of the Prime Minister is still uh, massively disappointed. It's been massively disappointed. But the number of circumstances that have surrounded why that is, I analyze it almost like a, in every decision that was bad, I look at the forensics. How did that happen? Why did that happen? Under Stephen Harper, no one needed forensics. Anything that went wrong, we knew. Every decision was made by Stephen Harper. It was top down. He had total control. 
when it comes to Justin Trudeau, he has created more cabinet government. Cabinet ministers are much more in control of their own portfolios. But there are a whole lot of other actors. And in the case of the SNC-Lavalin situation, I'm, I'm deeply shocked slash horrified by how many influential Canadians work for SNC-Lavalin or used to work for SNC-Lavalin. How is it that former Supreme Court Judge Frank Yacobucci is a lawyer for SNC-Lavalin at the same time that he's in and out of PMO to be asked to oversee the consultation with Indigenous people to allow Kinder Morgan to go ahead, within which SNC Lavalin will get contracts for building and expansion of Kinder Morgan if it goes ahead. How is it that the numbers of people from the former clerk of Privy Council, who was Michael Warnick's old boss, who is now the chair of the board of SNC Lavalin? who of course is able to pick up the phone and talk to Michael Warnick. So I don't know who was calling the shots here. And without suggesting that I'm backing up and defending Justin Trudeau, because I honestly don't know, I don't know who it was who decided to tell Michael Warnick to do a shakedown exercise over the Minister of Justice and Attorney General and threaten her. It was veiled threats, but they were pretty clear with threats. And I don't know if after she testified when he came back, I don't know how many of you watched this guy. I was sitting there talking to him. <laughs> but for him to say when people said, okay, Jody Wilson Raybould had this account of a face-to-face -face meeting with him in September and an hour and a half phone call that he made to her December 19th. And in the hour and a half phone call, in the, in the, in the September meeting, he talked about Frank Yacobucci and said, Frank's no shrinking violet. What, we're going to be in trouble because SNC Lavalin has a tough lawyer and the Minister of Justice and Attorney General should be prepared for that? What did that mean? And then we go to his conversation December 19th where her evidence, which I think was very persuasive, was that she actually stopped him and said, is this like the Nixon era? Is this like the Saturday Night Massacre where we're going to lose a whole bunch of attorneys general? What's going on here? Um, and he also said to her, apparently, Prime Minister's made up his mind, he's gonna get this one way or another, you better be aware of that, you ought to think about the consequences. That does sound like, like threatening behavior. And when he testified to the committee, and we asked as, as committee members, well, that was her version, what's your version of what you said to her that day? He said, I wasn't wearing a wire. <laughs> I don't remember. You don't remember? You didn't take some notes? You're the clerk of Privy Council? and you're threatening the Attorney General and it didn't occur to you that maybe you wanted, if you weren't threatening her, maybe you should have some notes about what you talked to her about for an hour and a half? So I'm, to tell you, so you, you, we talked about this at Main Island Town Hall, I think it was, uh, we talked about what's happening in Ottawa and I tend to give people perhaps too generous the benefit of the doubt. But I always figure, until I have all the facts, I hold off condemning. I have enough facts right now to say Michael Warnick should be fired. I don't have enough facts right now to know who told him to do what he did. If it was Justin Trudeau, my opinion of Justin Trudeau would go from he's disappointing to irredeemable. But if somebody else has it, for, for instance, the current chair of SNC-Lavalin, Warnick's former boss, there are a lot, there are far too many people in this country in positions of power who seem to be in the clutches of a corporation charged with extreme, extremely, how do you even describe what SNC Lavalin is in charge of? Bribing officials in the Gaddafi regime, providing prostitutes to Gaddafi's son to get a contract to build a prison in Libya with the US. That's not the face of Canada I want to see overseas. So I want to get to the bottom of it and I want to shine a really bright light on whatever evidence the prosecutor has on snc Lavalin. And I'll add one more thought, because people attack me on Twitter all the time that I don't care about jobs. Well, that's not people, that's bots and trolls. But anyway, um, <laughs> I've got a great solution. Let snc Lavalin not go to court. Let's find out all the facts about this case. Even people who were previous chairs of board who might want to protect their reputations. Can look it up and see all the people who've been chairs of boards at SNC Lavalin. If they're found guilty, we can step forward, they can use the DPA then and say, we've got a solution to keep all the workers working, 
things will hum along. SNC Lavalin is sentenced to five to ten years of community service. We will give them tons of contracts to do all the work. All the workers will do the work, all the materials will be purchased, but they don't get a profit and they don't get any dividends to shareholders. But they'll be very busy because all the workers and the engineers will be tasked with providing clean drinking water in every First Nations community. the light rail we need or some of the east-west electricity grid can work better and they're so smart and so they are they've got lots of smart people they've got lots of good workers well we need that work done but their punishment in community service is that they just won't get the profit margin which means the government of Canada will have to pay a lot less to get all this work done so anyway, there's a whole new idea, because I don't know what we've ever had a lot of corporate crime, right? I don't know if people have had a lot of corporate crime. We haven't had a lot of trials over corporate crime. And we haven't had a lot of good ideas for how do you sentence a corporation that's guilty of bribery and corruption in a foreign country. So it's just an idea.